Hello everyone. This is Dr. Hazem Muhammad Abdul Tawab, Professor and Consultant of Otorhinolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, Cairo University, Egypt. In today's presentation, I'm going to speak about coanal atresia, which is a very important and a common congenital anomaly, which is happening to the infant or to the newly born. The importance of this subject comes if the patient or if the infant is complaining from bilateral rather than unilateral coanal atresia, which is sometimes causing a very much respiratory distress. So going to start with what is called the coanal atresia, how it comes, the causes, and how to treat it. Definition. Actually, what is coanal atresia and why it's happening? Quinal atresia is a congenital obstruction of the posterior nasal openings. So we have anterior nasal openings, which are called the nostrils, and posterior nasal openings, which are called the quani. So we have posterior quana to one side and posterior quana to the other side. So it's a congenital obstruction of the posterior nasal openings of the nose due to persistence of the buccopharyngeal membrane. So what is this buccopharyngeal membrane? Please look at this picture here. This shows what is the buccopharyngeal membrane. It separates the ectoderm outside here from the endoderm. This is the ectoderm and this is the endoderm and there is a membrane here. It is a separation between the developing stomodium and the foregut. So this membrane, if persists, it means that there is no communication of air here. It means that this is outside and this is inside. If this membrane persists, it means that the child's nose later on will become blocked or closed by the buccopharyngeal membrane. So again, it's a membrane and an early embryo that is composed of ectoderm and endoderm. So ectoderm is here, endoderm is here, and separates the foregut, which is inside, from the stomodium, which is outside. Persistence of this membrane will cause the posterior quanal atresia. Incidence. Actually, it is mostly unilateral, uh, but sometimes it happens bilateral, and bilateral quanal atresia is a big problem to the newly born because the, every infant or newly born is an obligate nasal breather. It means that he is only taking his breath through the nose. Still, he did not have how to open the mouth and to take breath uh, from that. So it means that it will be causing so much distress to that child if he's having bilateral quinal atresia. Still, there are some types of quinal atresia, which are the bony, 90% of cases. It means that there is a, a, a piece of bone which is closing the posterior quina. Sometimes it's only a very thin membrane that sometimes it is missed after, uh, missed in diagnosis, I mean, after the child is born. Because after the child is uh, born, usually there is some suction. Some suctioning is happening through the nose and through the mouth. Sometimes this membrane becomes ruptured with the catheter. So some of the diagnoses are being missed uh, if it is only membranous. But most of the cases will be bony only. So it will be like 90% of cases will be bony uh, atresia. So what is the clinical picture if the case is unilateral? And what is the uh, clinical picture if the case is bilateral? So for this picture here, seen by endoscopy, this is the turbinate and the nasal septum. This is the middle turbinate. This is the inferior turbinate. This is the nasal septum. And this is the quana. And instead of that, the quana should be continuous and I should see the nasopharynx. No, it is here closed. So uh, what about the clinical picture of unilateral quanal atresia? Uh, it is a nasal obstruction and nasal mucoid discharge, which is unilateral. Unilateral nasal obstruction, I got it well, because the nose here is closed. But why unilateral nasal mucoid discharge and how it comes? Usually all the mucosa of the nose secretes uh, the secretions, its secretions or the secretions, and the mucous blanket of the nose are pushing all the mucous secretions to the nasopharynx by the effect of the mucous blanket. So if this posterior part is closed, it means that all the secretions which are happening in the nose are going to collect and be retained here. So it's a retention. So the discharge will be mucoid coming from the anterior nose 
So the clinical diagnosis will be based on unilateral nasal obstruction and unilateral nasal mucoid discharge. It's not a mucopurulent because there is no infection here, but it's only mucoid, sometimes so much viscid because of retention. So signs, signs is, uh, uh, I mean by signs, they are what you find by your examination. So first of all, it's failure to do the fog test. How can I do the fog test? Usually we are getting the tongue depressor in front of the nostrils of the child, of the baby, and see if there is fogging on the tongue depressor or on the mirror, for example. You get a, a small piece or a small mirror and put it in front of the child's nose and see how it's go is going to cause fog on the mirror. If you have fog to one side and the other side is not fogging, it means that this side mostly is having uh, some quinal atresia. But please do not depend on that only because sometimes with some cases of hypertrophied inferior turbinates or uh, uh, mucosal uh, problems or deviated nasal septum, you will find decreased fogging or no fogging one side. So please do not depend only on the fog test. It helps you to suspect, but it is not the full diagnosis. Failure to pass a, a suction catheter. Usually the pediatric pediatricians after uh, delivery of the child are doing suction so they are going to do the suction by the suction catheter usually they are passing the suction catheter through the mouth and through the nostrils so the early diagnosis is going to be made by them only because they are going to pass the catheter bilateral if one catheter uh, if the catheter is not passing on one side he will feel resistance so he's going to notify the ENT doctor that I have a suspected child with unilateral quinal atresia then failure to pass colored drops to the throat. This is rarely used now because we are depending on the endoscopy. So like, for example, if you have the suspicion by doing the fog test and the suspicion by doing, uh, by not failure to pass the suction catheter, uh, usually we are going for endoscopy or CT scan. Endoscopy, uh, the fiber optic, I mean, if the child is an infant or maybe the rigidoscope if he is bigger than that. So passing color drops it means that i'm going to install in the nostrils in the nose itself color drops bilateral then i will open the mouth i will uh, i open the mouth of the child or the infant and see where the uh, color drops are coming if they are coming from the right side for example and not coming from the left side on the nasopharynx it means that this one this side is closed endoscopy is the gold uh, is having a golden rule in that because you can in introduce the rigidoscope, uh, the 2.7, for example, mm, or you can pass the fiber optic scope, which is going definitely to help you with the diagnosis. Uh, take care that uh, it might present late. As I have said before, it will not cause that much distress because the child is having a normal breathing through the other nostril. So we have seen some patients with unilateral quinal atresia at the age of 14, 15, 20, and something like that. So sometimes it's not being diagnosed well. This is the clinical picture of bilateral quinal atresia. So how is this picture taken? It has been taken from the nasopharynx. So we are looking with the uh, uh, either scope uh, uh, 30 or 45 degrees or the posterior uh, mirror, the posterior the nasal mirror, uh, it shows the quana. This is the, the picture of the quana from behind, not from in front, because this is the uh, nasal septum from behind in the nasopharynx. So this is the quanal atresia bilateral. This is a membrane here closing both sides. So actually all the problems comes with the diagnosis of bilateral quanal atresia because it is causing bilateral nasal obstruction and mucoid discharge. Difficult suckling. Why is that? Because the child cannot uh, just grab uh, the, uh, is in, in, for example, if he's taking the bottle fed or if he's taking the normal breastfeeding, he's not able to take the full suckling because he is an obligate nasal breather. So if the nose is closed, he's trying every now and then to open the mouth. That's why it will cause difficult suckling for him. The other thing is that it's causing emergency respiratory distress. And please take care that it is not a strider. The word strider in the nose is not right. You should say strider if it is a laryngeal problem. But you may say difficult nasal breathing or you should say a respiratory uh, distress or the respiratory difficulty. But strider here is a, 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 actually is a wrong uh, uh, term to be used. 
Actually, there is some, something related to the physiology, which is the cyclic distress. The child is having a respiratory distress, which makes him deficient of oxygen. This will cause him to be cyanosed. And then after cyanosis, the child is fighting to get air, which will cause him to cry. The crying itself is going to help the child because at the time of crying, the child is going to open his mouth. Opening the mouth actually helps the child to get air through the mouth. So the child is improving, so he will become calm. And then again, the cyclic distress is happening, and then the cyanosis, and then the crying, which is going to open the mouth to improve the condition by getting air through the mouth. In the signs, you should see the same signs. For example, as we have said before, failure of the Fock test, it will be bilateral. Failure to pass the catheter, it will be bilateral. And the endoscopy, it will show you the bilateral. Uh, uh, but you should take care that in this time the disease and the lesion and the findings will be bilateral rather than unilateral. What is the best investigation if you wish to take that child for a certain diagnosis and a confirmed diagnosis? Please do a CT scan and the best cuts will be the axial cuts, not the coronal cuts. Why is that? Because I need a cut showing the nose in front and the nasopharynx behind. Rather than seeing a coronal cut from up down, I want to see it from anterior to posterior. Then I will see the air which is coming. For example, in, the, in this nostril, the air is coming all through the way to the nose, to the nasopharynx. But you will find here that there is block here, which is mostly secretions retained in the posterior part. And you will find some atritic bony blades, sometimes membranous here. So it means this one is unilateral quanal uh, atresia seen by CT scan axial. Why I, uh, I should say without contrast, uh, I, I want to see the air only. So no need for the contrast. This is air. But with the contrast, uh, as I have said in, uh, in, uh, in many lectures before, the contrast we are using actually in suspicion of tumoral uh, diseases or suspicion of vascular diseases. Uh, at that time only I use the contrast. So here I don't need the contrast. Actually, I will do the axial cut and please do it thin cuts. What I mean by thin cuts is sometimes the cuts of... Uh, of the film will be like 5 mm between each film and the other one. Sometimes you miss where is the atritic plate. So you need to make them consecutively thin cuts, like for example, 1 to 2 mm. This will show you the type if it is, uh, uh, for example, membranous. For example, here, if you see also, this is one side passing and this side is not passing. These are retained secretions. And you see here, you see some atritic bony blades, whether it is membranous bony. For example, here it is bilateral. You can see the nasopharynx and both sides here are closed. So it is a, a very uh, confirming diagnosis and reassuring as well. If you are going to do a procedure, they are going to help you with the type if it is bony or membranous, which is more easier. And the extent, how much the length of the atritic blade. Is it a, a big blade or just a thin plate like in this one? Uh, before... Uh, X-ray was used, but not used nowadays because of the advances in the CT scan. They were putting in lipidol dye in the nose and see if passing. So, for example, he's going to install lipidol dye uh, drops in the nose and then have photographs lateral to the, uh, to the head and see if this lipidol will stain or come to the nasopharynx and will be seen by the X-ray shots. Not, not, not used nowadays, of course, with the advances of endoscopy and CT scan. So uh, this is a sagittal reconstruction. We should not say I'm going to do a CT scan, a sagittal cut. It is not like that. The cuts of the CT scan are uh, uh, either coronal or axial. So sagittal reconstruction it is happening only with the good machines. So it is on the computer only. What they are going to do, they are going to just make a mix between the coronal and the axial cuts to make a sagittal reconstruction where you can see the head from the side. For example, here you can see that the air in the nose is not coming to the nasopharynx and here is a big atritic plate which is closing the nasopharynx from the posterior, uh, from the posterior quana. Treatment. Again, let me tell you that unilateral is completely different from bilateral cases. Bilateral is emergency. So let us start, don't look at the pictures right now, and go with me in the unilateral cases. Unilateral cases is not urgent at all because sometimes it is missed, as I have said, in diagnosis. But if it is causing too much distress to the child, again, we are going to treat it as the bilateral, I'm going to say, after a while. So 
most of the cases of unilateral uh, are not urgent because they are not distressing. So at that time, if I need to do surgery because of the too much respiratory distress, for example, uh, that child is having a deviated septum to the patent side, to the other side, which is having patent quana and the unilateral quanal atresia side is not also working. So it means that he will have kind of respiratory distress. At that time, you need to do endoscopic drilling with the use of and the guide of endoscope. I'm inserting my drill and doing the repair through the nose itself. Sometimes we have another approach, which is the transpalatal. Uh, in order to understand, to understand the transpalatal, if I said that this is the nose of the patient. So here is the, uh, the floor of the nose, which will come the, uh, the, actually this is the ballot. This is the floor of the nose. So if this quanal atresia here, for example, is closed, if there is the posterior quana is closed, usually I'm going with the oral approach transpalatal. I'm going here to drill here in the posterior part of the ballot to open the quana. I'm coming directly to open the quana with my drilling through the oral approach. So it's coming as transpalatal. It means I'm coming from the ballot, from the floor, rather than the scope. The scope comes directly from here, from the nose and drilling that atritic plate. So again, if I'm going to tell you about the uh, bilateral cases, what we should do? Bilateral actually is the a respiratory problem because it causes the respiratory distress that the child is having since the time uh, um, it is delivered or he's delivered. It is an urgent thing to manage. And the key word is that is to keep the mouth open. What I mean by keeping the mouth open, the problem with the child, as I said before, that he's obligate nasal breather. So he's still not teached to have the mouth breathing. So we need to keep the mouth breathing by either putting that one, which is called a uh, plastic airway. This one is the plastic airway or putting the McGovern nebel catheter, which is like that and tying it around the head. It means that I'm going to keep the mouth open at all time. Uh, also, uh, endotracheal intubation is ETT. Endotracheal intubation is an important thing. Sometimes we use it and then we will do the definitive repair. The definitive repair will be the same thing as endoscopic drilling. It will be bilateral here or transpalatal approach, as I have said, in the unilateral cases. After doing the repair, usually the quana after opening, they are tending to heal again and they become uh, stenosed again, causing recurrence. So after repairing, we put these stents in the nose uh, for a couple of weeks and then removing. At that time, uh, we give the uh, parents some saline drops. So they are keeping to install these saline drops in the nose all the time. They will keep the air. And then after, for example, four to six weeks, we are going to remove these stents after complete healing of the posterior uh, quana uh, so that to avoid the recurrence. Uh, it's a very nice and very uh, 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 important item that I hope that uh, it reached you well, uh, and I'm happy to receive your questions. Uh, thank you so much.